Good afternoon, right? This is the best service here. You guys get a little more room to spread out, but there's actually quite a few people here. So if you're joining us online, I'm glad that you're a part of our, our, of our newly minted fourth service starting Saturday night and then three on Sunday. And uh, we're real excited about what we're doing with the beginning of this year doing this series, Breaking Free. Uh, we believe that this is going to be a year of freedom for our church, for you. And we're doing that by beginning a series, four-week series. Talk, we're going to be talking about breaking free, breaking free from strongholds. Then it's going to go right into small groups. It's one and the same. They're connected. Part of what I'm hoping to do in the four weeks is to motivate you to get into a small group. That's really the place where life change happens anyways. That's why we're all into small groups. But we're going to be doing an all-church series that we all do together. We're, we're going to be talking about freedom. So the online registration begins on the 24th, and then at the end of the month is when we'll actually begin them. It'll be 12 weeks long. Some of you, you know what, I think some of you are supposed to be leading or hosting a group, and if that's you, we want to train you. We want to work with you. We'll show you how to do it. It's not that hard. Uh, so Thursday nights here during this month, Every Thursday night, you show up at 6.30, and we, will, we have about an hour and a half training that will show you exactly. You'll just be super comfortable on how to lead or host a small group. We'd love to have you to be part of that, because we certainly would love to have uh, some, some more leaders to help us. But regardless, everybody, we want you to be involved in that. And then it will conclude, 12 weeks, will conclude with a Freedom Conference. Very excited about that. Some incredible things are going to happen there. I mean, other than we're going to feed you really good. We have a, some gifts for you. It's going to be a lot of fun. It'll also be super impacting. You will really turbocharge your spiritual growth into 2021. So, uh, you know, pull out your calendar, write it down. If you've got a, an electronic calendar, put those dates in. April 30th is a Friday. So, uh, that you, you can still work on that day. It's, it actually begins, we'll, we'll do kind of a light dinner together, um, but it, it, it'll be the evening and then, sa- and then May 1st is a Saturday and that'll go from, we'll have breakfast together and go till about 3, 3.30. So definitely you'll want to be part of that. And on your program, you have a pastoral care card. That's for us to know how to get a hold of you if we need to. It's not a mailing list. We don't give it to anybody. It's just so that in, in, if there's a, something that comes up where you are in, you know, you're, you're in a typical place in your life, we can reach out to you. you know, we, we can connect with you. And so there the pastoral care card gives us updated information. You know, when COVID happened, we do this every year, and we thought, oh, good, you know, our pastoral care cards, we, you know, I'm sure they're all up to date. 20% of our information was wrong. Couldn't reach out to people, couldn't connect to them, and we wanted to call them. Hey, how are you doing okay and during this time? So this really is very helpful. At the end of the service, you can put that in the clear box that's on the doorway as you leave. If you're online, uh, then we have a connect card for you, a lot of the same information. We'd love to get that from you if we could. Well, as I said, we're doing this series on breaking free. Today we're going to be talking about breaking free from addictions. And really the thing that holds us into addictions is, is, is the lies that we often buy into that we're not even aware of. Now our theme verse for this whole series is this one out of 2 Corinthians. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So there's a war going on. We talked about that last week, a war in our mind. And the world wages it one way to get what they want. They use violence and they manipulate, they, you know, they rage out, they use guns, all kinds of things. But there's a, there's a biblical way to wage a war, God's way. He says it's different. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Instead, they have defined divine powers to demolish, and this is a key word here, strongholds. That's really like a, a word for addiction. Uh, you, we, that word addiction is kind of a newer word. What The Bible word for that is a stronghold, something that's got us locked up, we can't get free from. And then we demolish arguments and every pretension. That's pretension is the lies, the argumentative lies. Those are the things that get us stuck in the strongholds that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient 
to Christ. So we looked at that again last week. It's this war in the mind. We take, our, we take captive those, those lies, and instead we say, no, we're going to believe in the truth that God says about us. So today we're talking about addiction lies. We're talking about strongholds. Here's, if now, the, if you study the Bible, there are dictionaries for the Bible, for the original language, because the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew. If you look at that, those, those dictionaries are called lexicons. If you open it up, you look up that word we just looked at with stronghold, it will say a prisoner locked by deception. That's what keeps people locked up. They believe something. They're deceived. It's not true about them. Somebody lied to them. Some uh, caregiver, a coach, a teacher, a boss, a peer, you know, and they, you, we kind of believe that. We start living that out. We live a life that isn't true, but because we think it's true, it, it, becomes, it becomes part of the stronghold in our life. So a part of breaking that stronghold is, is, is setting aside, recognizing it's a lie, setting it aside, and putting in a biblical truth. An addiction is anything that I love to do, or excuse me, that I do, sometimes I love to do it, that I don't want to do. If I were to ask you, you know, do you know somebody who's addicted? Probably everybody here would raise their hand. If I were to say, is that you? You'd say no, because we tend to think addiction is somebody addicted to cocaine or illicit sex, gambling, alcohol. Those are go-tos. But the truth is, there's all kinds of addictions. You can be addicted to spending or shopping. You can be addicted to, uh, to porn. You can be addicted to work. You can be addicted to your phone. I mean, people, you know, more and more people, they just, they have their phone wherever they go, right? I mean, we sleep with it. We're like, you know, if you're not always looking at it, I mean, they're, they're actually classifying overuse of, you know, looking at, you know, the phone all the time as almost as like a, as a mental health issue. We've had people that say, we want to baptize, and they say, can I have my phone? Well, you know, because it's waterproof. No, you know what, you're not going to be underwater that long. You can, we'll hold your phone right here, almost like, you know, they're going to just go in for a second. I mean, it can be unhealthy. So anything can become this place of addiction. Now, I love the Bible because of how honest it is. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, a big part of it, and he writes Romans, and in there, he takes a whole chapter talking about this struggle, this stronghold, this addiction. Now, Paul's real honest about it. He says, hey, I love the Lord. I'm saved. It's not a salvation issue. But the truth is, even though I put Christ in my life, I have these other issues that I'm struggling with that are not God's best for me. And then he tries to, and he talks about it, the, the difficulty of that. Notice what he says here. He says, so I find this law at work. He's talking about he, he, he knows what he should do, but he's not doing it. He goes, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Kind of like, you know, somebody whispering into his ear, a little devil whispering into his ear. For in my inner being, I delight in God's word. He goes, I'm a good person. I love the Lord. He goes, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, and they're waging war. They're not, they're not connected. You know, we would hope, I mean, wouldn't it be great is if we put our faith in Christ and everything is just like transformed. You know, everything we pray for happens. Everything, you know, all of our uh, desires that are self-destructive just dissipate. And we just, I mean, well, that's, I guess that's heaven, right? That's, that's, that's heaven. That's not here, right? Here, we, we, we begin the journey to heaven when we ask Christ into our life. But then there's this war that starts to be waged against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. He's talking about addiction. See, hey, I, I know what I want to do. I, don't, I, I, I get sucked into something that I'm not happy with, and it starts to control me. He goes, I, you know, I just start feeling bad about myself. He goes, it's hurting my self-esteem. He calls himself wretched. I just, I look in the mirror. I don't like what I see. It makes me feel bad. Now, the, na the nature of addiction does these things. It starts to pull and strip away from who we really are, what God says about us. Here's the first thing. It becomes part of our identity. It's no longer just something I do. It's who I am. You know, this idea that, you know, just this idea that, that what you do or what you did is who you are, that is not true. Who you are is what God says is about you, what you can be. He sees the potential. He sees where you're going. That's, what, that's the truth, and that's what we want to replace 
you know, this lie of what I, what I do or what I did is who I am. You know, my daddy was always, you know, had anger issues. His daddy always had anger issues. I have anger issues. It's just who I am. That's just, that's, it just runs in our family. And it's part of who I am. It's, listen, that is not the way God sees you. Now, I understand in recovery groups, 12-step, I think they're terrific. We've, I know a, a lot of personal friends that have gone through recovery, gone through the 12 steps, and, they, and they do, there is the part when it comes to a, a disease, you know, with, with alcohol or, or drugs or what have you, where they have to own that and say, you know what, I, I actually have a disease that's going on in my life. I, I get that. But what I'm talking about is when we start to identify our addiction as that's, that's who I am. That's how I'm supposed to be. That's how God, that's God's best for me. That is, and that's just not true. So we identify it often that, and then when I try to, to quit but fail, and then I just start feeling hopeless. You know, we've done that. After a while, it can get discouraging, right? I mean, some of you might even be thinking, if you've been coming to Vineyard for a while, you might be thinking, hey, hey, pastor, this is not my first rodeo. I've heard you talk about freedom before. I've tried some of the stuff you did. It didn't work. I'm still stuck in where I'm at, and I'm just saying that don't fall into hopelessness. Because things can change. Your marriage still can get better. You say, no, no, we're, it's, 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 beyond, it's beyond help. No, it's not. It can, God can still do stuff in your life. You know, you start breaking away at it. And if you stay at it long enough, who knows when that final thing is, you know, that last stroke of the hammer and that crumbles. And for some of you, that is going to be in the freedom series we're doing uh, as we launch into this year. And any threat to my addiction becomes a threat to me. We become defensive. Somebody who cares about us says, hey, have you noticed that's kind of getting out of control in your life? That you're not really managing that well? And, you know, if somebody, has somebody ever done that where they just come and they, they confront you? I think, that, I think that, that's, go, that's a problem for you. What do we do? Most, do we generally say, oh, thank you so much. You're looking out for me and you care about me and probably wasn't easy to talk to me about that. No, what we do is we get defensive generally, right? We blow up. How dare you talk to me about, you think you're perfect? Do you, you know what all the things you're dealing with? And we just get, listen, as long as you stay defensive, you're going to stay in bondage. You want to get free, you, you don't have the luxury to get defensive. Because the truth is, there's people in your life that care about you. There's a church that you have here at Vineyard that loves you, and certainly God loves you. And when you let people speak into your life, that is part of how God sets you free. Then I begin to lose my life. I start feeling, oh, you know, this, this water under the bridge, too much. There's, you know, if you'd gotten to me, Andy, years ago, that's different. But, you know, I'm a hopeless case. That's how we tend to feel. I'm hopeless. It's, it's not going to work anymore. And uh, that's... That's just not true. And then we just go, fall right back into it. You know, I feel so bad. I feel, I've, I'm just, you know, I need another fix. I need another hit. I need another, uh, whatever my addiction is, because then that kind of soothes me for the moment. But it's a cycle, and it keeps us stuck in there. So Paul talks about that, continuing in that same chapter. He says, I've tried everything. <laughs> Some of you, that's, you've said that before, that exact phrase. I've tried it all. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. He says, is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Now, he's, he's setting us up, you know, because he, he actually has the answer. He's figured it out, but he's saying, hey, I get the struggle. It is real. He goes, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. And that is the answer. It is found in Christ. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions. He says, hey, I've experienced that. My spirit wants to do this. My soul, which is my emotions, my mind, my will, wants to do this. My flesh has its own cravings. And there's this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. I think it, we can all relate to that, right? All of us. We're stuck there. How do you get out of that? You know, we saw the, the you know, the, the very nature of addictions kind of feeds on itself, keeps you stuck there. Well, he gives the answer right out in chapter 8, the very beginning. He says, he says uh, therefore, there is now no condemnation. Say that with me, no condemnation. That's God's word. No, if you're feeling condemned, 
you're, you, either you're condemning yourself, uh, you're, you're, you're your worst self, you're, you're, you're your own enemy, you know, you have all the negative self-talk, or maybe other people are just ma- pulling you down, condemning you, making you feel bad. None of that is God's pathway for you. That is not the voice of God. That's the devil or somebody else. He says, no, in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Because through Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now here at Vineyard, we try to create a culture of no condemnation. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're all struggling. We recognize that. Uh, none of us are perfect. We know that we have ups and downs in life. And we, have, we, we, we you know, it's just the frailty of humanity. We're all part of humanity. So we all have things that we're working on. And we're honest about that. And that, that's important because if you feel like you have to pretend, you're not going to grow. And then you're just playing church. We all know about playing church, right? You're arguing on the way to church with your, with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse. I mean, just ripping into each other or you're doing, you know, your job is just falling apart on you or your health and you're just in a terrible place. You come to church and people go, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Praise the Lord. You know, yep, everything's good here. Praise Jesus. I love it here. I know that if you're not doing well, you just be honest about it. That be, but if you feel condemned, that's not a safe place, right? Somebody starts condemning you. I, I saw this comic recently. I like this. It says, hurry up, Ted. This is his family. You're the only one not ready for church. They have all their mask on. Ted's mask is on. He's going, you know, I don't want to have to wear a mask. I don't want to play church. Have you ever felt like Ted? <laughs> I don't want, if I have to go and, and pretend I'm, everything's fine, then they really don't love me. They don't really care about what I'm going through. And th- my friends, that, that is not what we want here. And where it really happens, though, is in small groups. That's where people can know you by name. People can know what you're going through. And e- there is even a temptation to wear a mask in a small group. It just only lasts for a few weeks. Usually by week four or week five, you start to realize these people care about me. These pe- this is a legit deal going on here. You know, this is, if, I'm, if I want to really grow with the Lord, I, I need to take my mask off. Everybody starts taking it off. You know, things really happen. God starts doing some amazing thing. Let me give you a few surprises about addiction you may or may not know. It's actually easy to understand. It's hard to experience, though. The, the biggest challenge, and I've been praying for you this morning and yesterday, I've been praying, Lord, help them to, to when they learn these surprises, that they, that they receive what it can do in their lives. Here it is. Number one. The root of every stronghold is really an issue of idolatry. Now, I know we don't use that word a lot here. I mean, in in our culture, right? You know, I mean, idolatry is kind of like this ancient thing that maybe they do in, I guess, what, you know, India or something. You know, Indiana Jones is probably the closest most of us get is, you know, he's always trying to steal an idol and run with it and get it into a museum. But in the Bible, idolatry is, is an issue of what we put our focus on. That's how it uses the term. The idolatry is, is what's our passion? What's our focus? What do we fix our attention on? What's the thing that consumes our, our, our emotional energy? Our, our time, all those things. Idolatry is anything we allow to sit on the throne of our hearts other than God. And so that's where addiction comes in because addiction becomes all-consuming. It's the thing that we gets all of our money. It's the thing that gets all of our attention, all of our time, our emotions. We, I mean, we, we fantasize about it and it becomes really a form of worship because whatever we worship, we love. And whatever we fall in love with, we become obsessed with. Whatever we become obsessed with, we start to imitate. Whatever we imitate, we start to become. And whatever we become starts to have power to control us. And so we want to be careful we don't fall into this area of idolatry. That's a big warning for us. So how do you overcome uh, addiction? Well, number one, you're making sure that what's first and foremost in your life is God and not something else. And like I said, it could be work, it could be your phone, it could be computer, it could be, it could be things that are harmful to you, it could be just things that normally wouldn't be harmful. But because it's taking center stage, it's not healthy for you, it's not good for you. So you put God first place in your life. This is not on your outline, great verse though that describes this. 
If you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? It means he's first place. You put God first place in your life and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation. So what's salvation? Salvation is not joining a church, is not getting baptized. Salvation is reordering your priorities, reorder, reordering what's most important in your life. And you're putting Jesus first. You know, in the Old Testament, we're all familiar with the Ten Commandments. You know, I don't know if you know the Ten Commandments, but the very first commandment, very first one, deals with this issue of what is first in your life. Look at this. The Ten Commandments. It says, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What's he talking about? Idols. That's why it's a small g. Something else that's, that's consuming your time, your energy, your passions. He goes, nothing should be before me because if that happens you're going to find it starts to have power over you control over you and destructive power in your heart set christ as lord how do i do that give god the first of everything give god the first of everything that's the key why do we do 21 days of prayer and fasting in january and not february march april some other time because we want to do it in the first of the year the very first weekend Right out of the gates, we're putting God first. We're going to pray, and we're going to fast. And we're going to do it for 21 days. Now, if you're just joining us, and you learned about the 21 days, well, you missed seven of those days, right? Well, then just do 14. Don't, I wouldn't get hung up on that. You can, God can still do a lot in your life in 14 days. So just, for you, it's 14 days of prayer and fasting. That's fine. But join us. Be part of what we're doing. We're putting God first. You know, at the, at the beginning of the week, that's why we worship together. We come together. The early church did that. They placed the, the services on Sunday because that was the beginning of the week. Now, I know a lot of us, we tend to think Monday is the beginning. But biblically, from a, from a mindset of you know, having good theology, Sunday is actually the beginning of the week. You get poured into, you get prepped. Then you go into your week because you put God first. It's a, it's a different perspective. But I think it's significant. You're putting God first. You get up in the, in the morning, you start out with, uh, with a prayer. You know, you kind of look to God, God today, is this, this is a day I want to serve you. I want to put you first today. You go, Andy, I'm not a morning person. Well, you know, your prayer might look different if you're, a mor if you're not a morning person, right? But I still think you should pray. If you're, if you're a morning person, you're going to say, good, you know, good morning, Lord. If you're not a morning person, it's going to be, good Lord, it's morning. You know, but you begin with a prayer and maybe read the Bible. You commit that. We do that with tithing. The Bible says that we tithe. We give the first part of our income to God, sowing into what he's doing. Because why? Because the church needs it. Well, that's not why we give, regardless of the church needs it or not. We give because we're putting God first in our life. God, I want to, I want to give, I want to, I want to Show that you're first place in my time, in my finances, and really it extends to anything, right? First place in my marriage, I want to make sure God is in my marriage. I want to, I, wherever I want God to bless, I want to make sure and put him first there. So I put God first in every area of my life. Say no to the flesh. This is another thing that we need to do. Jesus said, you know, pick up your cross and follow me. You know, he's talking about crucif you know, just putting to death those things that will cause death in our life if we don't put them to death. You know, so denying your flesh, that's not easy to do, right? So many of us, we struggle with that. But it's something you grow into. You grow into denying your flesh. You know, in 21 days of prayer and fasting, a part of the reason we fast is we learn to say no to the flesh. That's why I love it. I think the, the, you see in most in the Bible is when people fast food. It's not that food's bad. You don't, you, no, we need food, but that's the whole point is that you need food and you're denying your flesh of that. And it's, 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 it, you keep saying, no, my spirit is, is, is in charge, not my flesh. My spirit is in charge, not my flesh. And you grow in that area. For some of you, you're fasting and you're a week into this because you started with us a week ago. And the honest truth is, it's not been hard for you. It's been easy. And, and, and for some of you, the reason is, you chose something too easy. And I believe God wants you to increase that. Keep what you're doing, that's great. But the honest thing is, you're not really 
saying no to your flesh. You have more in you that you could do because you could grow in that area. And when you grow in that area, it starts to affect other areas of your life. Five years ago or so, I, I was wakeboarding. I, I, I tore my knee up really bad. I tore the ACL tear, uh, the kneecap. It needed a lot of reconstructive surgery. And so, you know, that's a painful surgery. So they gave, they gave uh, Sharon some opioids. They said, well, to give this to him, you know, because he's going to need it. It's super painful. So she did. She started giving me the opioids. But, but they said, hey, it's very, very addictive, so be careful. And so she gave me them the first few days. And, uh, hey, man, they felt, you know, actually, I, I felt no pain. You know, you take those drugs, and I get it, you know. Wow, you feel good. I was calling the, the office staff saying things. I don't, Sharon told, took away my phone. She goes, uh, you know, and I, I said, what am I saying? She goes, you don't need to know. But it's, so, it's this, you know what, they don't need to hear from you right now. You know, you're way out of control. So, so I don't know what I said, but uh, so there's a downside to opioids, I guess, you know, they make you feel good, but who knows what is going to come out. But, but, you know, they were concerned about, you know, me being addicted and coming off. And after a few days, I said, I don't think I need those anymore. I just cut cold turkey, no problem. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that I think that when you learn to say no to your flesh, it apply, you start to get that discipline in your life. It doesn't always have the rain. You don't always have to give into it. Your, your flesh will cry out, oh, I want this, I want this. No. You know, kind of like a parent to a kid, right? No. You're, who, why? Why can the parent do that? Parents in charge. Homes where that gets reversed, it's all, you know, it's crazy, right? And you're in charge, your spirit's in charge. If it gets reversed, it gets crazy. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather, notice he says, offer yourselves to God for sin shall not be your master. You're not going to let that grow. And, and it's not that you work on your stuff. You kill that stuff. He says, you just flat out deny those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and de desires. It's that simple. You say, you're not getting your way. What I starve dies. Jesus said, the, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And so you say, I'm just going to starve that. And it's going to be a regular discipline, a regular routine in my life that I make sure and, and, and let my body, let my soul know who's in charge. It's my spirit. And so that's, that's a big part of shaking addiction out of our life. Put God first place, say no to the flesh, and then go all in with Jesus. You just go all in. You don't hold anything back. God, I, I want to serve you with, with all my life. Here's the way the Bible says. It says, fix your attention on God. What's got your attention? What has your attention? And so that's what it means to go all in. You know, there's God, I'm giving you my attention. And then God starts to change us, not like the world from the outside in, but from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to the level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. This is the key to disrupting that stronghold in your life. And it'll happen this year. In fact, it can be really begin in a big way today. Because today when you say, I'm going to replace a lie with the truth, that I'm not going to tie my identity into it, I'm not going to get sucked into where I, all of the things with addiction where I feel like I'm hopeless, it's too late, uh, I'll just give into another fix. No, I'm going to continue to put God first. What I starve dies, but what I feed thrives. And I'm going to feed my spirit. I'm going to go all in with Jesus. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, thank you for this, this way we can start our year off um, right, putting you first, denying our flesh, and going all in with you. You know, God has a call for you. Some of you, during the worship part of this service, you knew that you, were for, you, you weren't close to God. We were singing those lyrics and, you, and, and, and as we were singing them, you actually had the thought in your mind, I need to get right with God. I need to get closer to the Lord. And that was the Holy Spirit. That wasn't just your own thoughts. That was God 
speaking to you because that is the way he does it. He's drawing you, wanting to connect with you, wanting to pour his, lo- his love and his power into your life. He wants something better for you. And you are not defined by what you do or what you've done. God sees you and the potential that you have, what he's created for you to do. But it's your turn. You need to walk toward that. Embrace that. Say, God, I want that. I'm going to replace all of the lies that have said, been said about me as you reveal them to me, and I'm going to replace it with truth. If that's you and you're saying, I'm ready to reorder my life, put God in the throne uh, of, my, of my heart, he's going to, I'm, I'm not, you know, you're not saying you're perfect. You're saying, I just want to focus on God. God gets first place in my life so that I can be prepared to receive what he has for me, the blessing he has. If that's you, I want to invite you to pray with me right now, right where you're at. Don't worry about other people. And this isn't about joining Vineyard. This is about you reordering your priorities in your life, making sure that God has first place. If that's you, pray with me right now, right where you're at. Say, dear God, today, I want to put you first place in my life. If you're joining online, you, you do it as well. Some of you, you're in that place. You know, don't go into this year with that thing out of whack. Dedicate your life right now to God. Say, dear God, today I want to put you first place in my life. Help me, God, to say no to my flesh. Help me to grow in that area. God, I want to go all in with you. Help me to experience what it means to have no condemnation. Help me to not condemn myself anymore. Help me not to listen to the voices, the condemning voices around me, people that try to pull me down. Help me to listen to your voice, God. The voice of truth, the voice that sees me the way I really am. God says that he loves you. Say, would you say, God, I want to receive your love today. Forgive me for buying into the lies and acting on them. Put your Holy Spirit in me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm really excited about what God is going to do uh, in your life because I just know that when we trust him, things start to really change. He starts to really unfold some great things in our lives. And so I'm excited for you. Um, if you prayed with me, let me know about it on your pastoral care card. There's a way to indicate any prayer request you might have. I want those cards anyways from you. And, uh, and then if you prayed with me and said, Andy, I, I reordered my life today, let me know about that. Uh, that way I can help you in your next steps. Uh, you know, your next step really is step two. If you haven't taken that, that's where we help you to get in passion for what he's called you to do in your life. And if you're fuzzy on that, or if, you, if you've not taken growth track, that's, that's where you kind of get on the same page and say, you know, with God, okay, the way you wired me, I want to start, I want to start serving you in that way. And uh, we're excited to do that. That's right after this service. As you leave, you'll see it. It's only an hour long. And, uh, uh, you know, we have some food in there. We'll watch your kids. Uh, we'd love to have you in there. Okay. Also, if you'd like to uh, support our church, you certainly can do that. Uh, we give out a, a life-giving, joyful heart. We don't do it because we have to. Uh, and if you're new with us or if that's kind of where you're at, please don't feel pressure to give. This is, we love to look for ways to invest in what God's doing, to put him first in our lives. And we get to do that through giving. And so here's a couple ways that you can do that. A Vineyard Live, of course, is an easy way if you're on Vineyard Live. Uh, our website, vineyardchurch.com, you can text 45777. And then put the amount in, or you can, uh, you know, do an online bank or a, you know, an old school check. If you're here, you could just, uh, you know, put it in the, the the clear box. Well, would you stand with me for those of you who are here or with us in our in person service? I'd love to pray over you as we transition to worship. Father, thank you, Lord, that you have the ability to break free, to give us hope, to extend our vision to something way bigger than we could ever have thought. Lord, we want to declare you our first place in our life and that we are all in. And we're going to sing that in Jesus' name. Amen.